The biggest mistake I see authors make is thinking that they have to be perfect or their message has to be so clear because they're changing in the middle of the writing and they notice something they wrote four months ago. Like, mm, I really don't think that anymore. I'm going to change. I'm like, be careful because when you're done with that, something else will look like that to you and you have to be cautious. And that's why you have to be present on the page and not so much, here's what I think, or here's what I know. And I think a lot of people get stuck in perfectionism. I think they're just procrastinating, putting something out there because they don't feel like it's going to represent them. What would the world look like if people felt like they mattered? Welcome to the Lead with Love podcast, exploring what it means to lead with love in business and life. I'm your host, Jada Selner, and in this show, I'll share meaningful conversations to help you, the creative, the entrepreneur, the world changer, reach more people, go after your dreams, and serve your community with love. I appreciate you joining me. Now, let's get cozy and start today's episode. Hi, Azul. Hey, Miss Jada. I love it, Miss Jada. <laughs> I'm in the South right now. I can't help it. <laughs> so I'm excited because this is round three of behind the scenes of the book writing process. Right. It's amazing. It has been a journey, hasn't it? It's a journey feels right. You know, like it's not even a sprint or a marathon, book writing is a journey. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So I'm excited for us just to dive in for those that are listening. My name is Jada, Rhymes with Prada. We're talking with Asul, the co-founder of Authors Who Lead. And that's the name of your podcast now too, right? That's correct. And you have, I just recently looked, you now on your TED X talk, uh, what makes a good teacher great? 2.7 million views. It's kind of unreal. How does that feel? It feels a little sublime because I never imagined that that talk would have resonated so much with people in a way that's so impactful. And in fact, I watched one. Sometimes I Google my name, right? (laughs) Or search on YouTube to make sure no one's posting something as me crazy. But I found this, it said, what makes a good teacher great? And some people will copy and post it to try to get views, right? Well, this, the camera came on, it was a little kid. He looked like about fifth grade, dressed in a little suit. And he, from, I guess, must have been a class, he gave my TED Talk in his version. And I thought it was such an honor to see a student, a young person, like talking about this in his way. Uh, And that was like, I was like, maybe this is, this is makes it all worth it because like they get it. They get what I was trying to say. So it feels amazing. Uh, I love it. And I know in our last conversation, when we were talking about, you know, behind the scenes of my next book, and we also know you, well, we don't know, but we're about to know that you're working on a book too. <laughs> yes, I yeah, I think it's grown over 600,000 new viewers. And so I, I just think it's interesting, right? Because you see like 2.1 and 2.7 and it's like, oh, six, you know, like it just feels like this point, <laughs> but it's, yes. that's, a, that's a lot of eyeballs learning about this, this idea, this message that you had to share. And so I'm excited to dig into, actually, I'd love to, can you just tell us a little bit about the book as much as you want to share? And then I will give an update on where I'm at with my book since our last conversation. Yeah, of course. So the journey for the TED Talk, which might help understand how it became to be as a book was like you, I decided I'd write a book proposal Uh, even though I wasn't exactly sure where I was going. And my book proposal kind of fell flat. And the proposalist said, this just isn't that interesting. (laughs) I kind of got on a soapbox about what's wrong with education, which that's not inspiring to anyone, but it was what I was feeling at the time. So it was honest. So the TED Talk was a reflection of, well, what if you just focus on what is good, which is what kids say of all these amazing, you know, 26,000 you know, responses you have. And so that's where the TED talk came from. And that's where the book's returning is I couldn't include all of the things that kids say to me, but I, I also couldn't do that in a book either. So I had to figure out what am I going to share here? So the book's really focused on a concept called being wild. So the being wild concept is really about, well, how do I 
do this thing of becoming a great teacher. Okay. It can't be just asking kids questions. It doesn't seem like useful, but be wild. It's about, you know, this simple principle of wondering what is it that kids are understanding, learning, knowing, invite them into the conversation by asking them what would make you great. Listen to them, listen to the, the, not just hear the words, but listen to what are their intent? What are they trying to say in kids speak? And then lastly, do, do what they say. Don't take it for granted that you know better when they say things like a great teacher sings, go do it because that's where you'll learn. And so the books are about the simple principles behind this be wild. And it's called a great teacher eats apples. And it's trying to help other teachers, especially young new teachers be inspired that maybe they can do things differently than, than they were schooled in traditionally. Mm, So where are you? I know we've, you and I, and for just a reminder, for those who don't know, I hired a soul to be my book coach, AKA my book doula to kind of help me (laughs) really dig into what is the heart of the stories that I want to tell and, and really unpacking that and excavating that. And you can actually go back and listen to part one at jadaselner.com forward slash 156. That will take you to behind the scenes of my next book, part one. And then part two is jadaselner.com forward slash 179. And, you know, on those episodes, we talk about how we kind of excavated the the soul of my book and, and what I really wanted to say. And so I, and then you and I kind of completed that that journey of of getting it out because I knew I didn't want to write a book that I mm-hmm. thought I should write. I wanted to write a book that my soul wanted to write and that it made sense to the market and to, you know, the clients and community that I want to serve. And so now we've we've shifted to a space of we've we've done a couple of co-writing sessions together, which I highly recommend for for people to be in a container, whether you join some type of program, even like the Soul, you have your program where I think you do co-writing sprints. I've been in a part of a couple of other groups and just friends, Nikki Elledge Brown, but just co-writing with other people. It's it's really great because you can, you know, set up a Pomodoro timer, set a timer for 25 minutes and write and take a five minute break. And then if you're co-writing with other people, you can kind of check in and see where people are at. And you and I have, you know, we've talked about our books or what we're working on or where we're stuck and we can kind of get unstuck pretty quickly through that process. So the last thing you was you were, you were writing a lot. Mm -hmm. Where are you in the process of the book right now? Yeah, that's a great question. And in the time of recording this, I have nine, no, 10 more days to finish the, the rough draft manuscript. So for two reasons, number one, it's overdue by three years, <laughs> but also I am going to be working on a fiction book during November, which is the national write a novel in the month sort of kind of month. And so I'll be writing for NaNoWriMo. And so I need to be done because I have to focus on a new book. So that's exciting. And I get motivated by pressure. Mm. So I'm excited about that because then it's going to go to an editor and I'm going to sit in their space and take all the punches like you normally do when you're getting edits (laughs) and be able to get the book revisions done before the end of the year, which I'll be excited about. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And just for those that are listening, NaNoWriMo, it's N-A-N-O-W-R-I. I M O, right? Correct. Yes, dot org, which is an amazing organization of I think they have in the month of November as well as is it July, possibly? They have uh, other events too, yeah. Yeah, of just, you know, writing a novel, a book, whatever you're working on in, in 30 days. And that seems to be a really good practice for you to yeah. generate. Yeah, that's amazing. So and and you up- get so much done in, in a short period of time that you don't think you can do. And it, it's a good impetus to start like refining your ideas. Because as you know, just because you wrote a draft from a manuscript doesn't mean it's the book. It just means you finished the manuscript and it's time to now figure out what the book is. Oh, every f- moment. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> where is the book? Oh, here. Now you just know a little bit more and more. The more that you write, the more that you edit, the more that you sit with the book the more that you let the pages rest and breathe and take a step away and wonder like I'm procrastinating, but actually you need that time and space to come back with fresh eyes. It's, it's such a journey, a dance and a beautiful relationship. So 
an update for me where I'm at with my book is, you know, I, the last time that we talked, I was submitting my book proposal. I just finished, you know, beautifying it with my designer, Chris Beltran, who used the new branding from my website designer, Rachel Pesso. And it was beautiful because we actually ended up creating a new website in that time as well. But I submitted the book proposal. We shopped it with my literary agent, Dave Fugate, who also represents Chris Gilbo for, for his books, which was a very fun and exciting collaboration. And I got a book deal with Harper Business at Ooh. the end of 2020. Woohoo! And that's a really big leap from when I know, you know, I was thinking about it and then you and I were working together on it and working on what the book is and then what's the book proposal. And it's just a lot of what's right. Like these questions of what is it? What are you? And I know that, you know, writing is thinking. It like allows you to figure out what it is that you think about things. And I feel like it's taken me a really long time to be like, oh, right. I'm not supposed to write just what I know or what everyone else knows. I actually found this quote from our last conversation. I want to find it. Oh, only writing from what we know versus writing a book from who we are. Mm -hmm. And that we're constantly changing and evolving too. So our our books, as we sit with them, as we let them simmer and marinate, that we build a deeper relationship with that book and also with ourselves in the process. So it's like our thought process about what we think is evolving and expanding in real time. So yeah, so I got the book deal the end of 2020. And we're now in 2021. (laughs) And yeah, I think I magically thought I could write a a manuscript in six months. I think that was like my original timeline to deliver, you know, because I had written 33,000 words the year Mm -hmm. before. (laughs) And that didn't, or in 2020, and that, no, it didn't, that didn't happen. It's much more when you have to sit with the page. And so I have rewritten the book. And that's, I don't know if you've done this as well as soul, right? You've written Mm -hmm. the draft, but then you have to write another draft. Did you do that at all? This is my third time. uh, This is actually will be the fourth of that same iteration because I thought I knew what it was and I got it out of me. And then I was like, this isn't it. And then I wrote again and like, well, this definitely isn't it. (laughs) So like, yeah, the book is telling you who it's supposed to be and who it's not during that process. And I, I, you know, in our co-working sessions, we're like, could you think about this? And it's like, Oh gosh, that's good. That's right. That that's some of that refinement comes out because when I spoke to a literary agent and I talked to her, I had a woman on my podcast who's an agent. I said, I want you to be honest. You'll watch my Ted talk and then just pretend like I'm a random dude. And you're going to tell me whether or not you would take this as a book deal and be honest and blunt on the podcast. I don't want to know what you're going to say at a time. And what was really great about that is that she goes, I, I love it. I love the idea. But what I'd ask as an agent is what else is there? Because a 15 minute tag talk isn't a several hundred page book. So what would you do? So that was really helpful because I, I had to go in and go, okay, what is this book really? What's the purpose? What's, what's the core message to the reader and what are they going to get when they finish this book? And that really helped me on this last iteration. I'm hoping it's the thing that actually brings it closer to where I get to start over again. <laughs> You're like, okay, now I got the basics and I can start writing the manuscript that's going to be the book. Yeah. I love that you said you're on your third draft. So I've written another another draft, which is I have 88,000 words in there. So I don't have a problem with things to say. My editor at Harper Business, she's like, that's not a bad problem. If that's our biggest problem is that we have too many words and we need to cut it down. That's, you know, that's a good, bad problem to have, you know, versus trying to like, oh, let's pull this out of you. And when you were saying like, you know, kind of getting to the core message and it's, if I think about your book and what's in there, it is what the TED talk is about and all the things, but it's almost like the book already knows what it is. And we're just trying to figure out like what it is. Does that make sense? Like it's already there. It's already there. That's all I can think of is like, when I think about the core message of my book, you know, kind of being like the anti-hustle handbook for women entrepreneurs to avoid burnout and to make, you know, really have more time for what matters most. And 
you know, just kind of getting off this like hustle culture and being able to build in sustainable ways. It's like, I've been writing about that the whole time. Like it already knew that it was that, but it's like, I didn't know it yet. Does that make sense? Where it's like, it's all, it's always been there. I think it's the same thing. And just like who we are ourselves, like individually, like we are who we are, but yet we're trying to find ourselves and deepen that self-awareness of who we are. Yeah. For a long time, I thought the core message of the book was for me. And so that's what was throwing me off because the core message of the book for me is we're not listening to students and we should. And that sounds, oh, okay. And it's intriguing a little bit. But what I realized in this re- this last manuscript rewrite is the core message for the reader is that being a good teacher isn't easy, but being a great teacher is easier than you think if you follow this simple path. Mm. Because that that's like, oh, okay. So I want to be great, but it it seems so hard, but maybe what you're saying is that it's not as hard as I think. And the, the goal is like the joyful outcome when they're done, because that's the other thing I wasn't thinking about in the first couple of drafts. I was just kind of venting a lot, to be honest, about <laughs> why it wasn't working. Was that the joyful outcome is really that the reader can learn a clear, simple path for becoming a better teacher with less work than you think, mm. um, utilizing the renewable resource of students and their thoughts. That's the joyful outcome that no matter what kind of school they teach in, and if it's, you know, even another country, that it isn't your lack of resources, isn't I don't have enough pencils or paper or computers. It's that you have this one right before you use it. So that helped me get clear about the book's message because that's really what I want to do is inspire that small group of people who want to be great, um, but are not seeing it in the traditional classroom or in their traditional college where they're being trained because they're telling them things from years ago that isn't serving kids. And I don't want to disrupt curriculum because I don't think it's a curriculum problem. I think it's an, a human or adult problem that we need to solve with kid thinking. What are some of your own thoughts that have come up as you've, you know, been working on the book, you know, kind of more of the, the inner critic or the, right. the thought I'm just, I'm just curious, like for you who, you know, you're a book whisperer, book coach, you help other people, you know, pull that out of them and get clear on what they want to share, you know, the message that they want to share and, you know, the words that they want to write, but you like, what are the thoughts that you go through as a writer, not as a book coach? Well, that's a great question. I I have a post-it on my computer. I try not to put too much clutter because I I get really weird when there's a lot of clutter. Like I feel like I should be doing other things. But the one post that I keep on my desk is one I wrote in big capital letters that says, I am an author. Because when I get those weird feelings like this is terrible and no one's going to like this, this is not going to be good. You know, now I'm competing with myself because now I have a TED talk that's actually doing really well. And that, so now I'm feeling mm-hmm. like, well, it's never going to be as good as that. Like that's where it's, what's going on for me, honestly, when I'm sitting down to write and I have to quiet that voice, like, shh, now be quiet. That's something that has nothing to do with this book. The thing I have to remind myself is that try not to get too big, too complex, because if you get complex, then the readers don't have anything to do. You have to keep the message so simple that the complexity comes from their thinking. So I was overstuffing with a lot of pedagogy, a lot of like, this is how versus this is the inspiration and this is how I got here. And then this is what they say, and this is how you can do it too. So the mundane, simple things are actually what interests people the most. It isn't what I think about those things. So sometimes I get lost in that and I get, I was a teacher and a, a, you know, professor and a principal. A lot of the stuff is ingrained in me, but I'm trying to talk to first, second, third year teachers and those aspiring to be teachers. And they don't know any of that stuff. They've ne- Some of them have never been in a classroom or they just started. So talking about all those complexities doesn't help them. And I have to remind myself of that and remember that the simple stories, the simple nuances are the most valuable and not get lost in my knowledge, what I know. And it's really a simple understanding that I like, oh, my aha in that moment was this. So I think for me, that's it. It's like, it's to let go of complexity, stay simple, and then focus on the ideal reader, the person who I'm intending this book to be about and not lose them in my knowledge. When you lean into the kind of sharing the pedagogy, the, how would you define pedagogy? Cause I, I know some people might not know. Yeah, that's great. So pedagogy is like the, the thinking behind, like, this is what school is. So like, 
if you go to Montessori, that would be a pedagogy, a belief of this is how schools run. Or traditional school, most of us know there's X number of periods, you have this many subjects, you show up, you take tests. The pedagogy is really around the structure of the way school works in a, in a general sense. And then other things fit underneath that, like what's the curriculum, what's the outcomes. But the general understanding of that is, well, what is school for? Mm-hmm. And what what is the role of the teacher And I'm trying to challenge them to say the role of the teacher is to be the servant of the student and to listen carefully, which is a huge shift. And I got to remind myself, like, this is a lot to ask people to shift because that's probably not how they went to school. And it certainly isn't what their principal is telling them or their district's telling them. So they're going to have to really fight against a very strong system. But if they use kids as leverage, no one will ever win. Kids will always be right. So that's the thing I have to help young teachers know is that don't ever try to get in a battle with administration or other teachers. Just show the proof in what happens in your classroom. Mm. So what do you think is the possible, is it a protection mechanism when you go into the complexity and sharing the pedagogy and what you know? You know, part of it is just training, to be honest. It's not even so much that I believe in all the pedagogy that I've actually been trained in. Yeah, it just It's just easy to revert back to educator speak, teacher yeah. speak. As opposed to remind myself, no, I have to use kids speak. What would kids call this? What would kids say this is? Because I don't want to, I don't want to influence their, their wisdom, but it also is confusing because like you have it, you have children. I have two that I've raised and they speak in kids speak. They might say something that isn't, the words don't match up with what they're communicating and you have to be in, in tune to that. And so I have to be careful not to try to turn it into education ease for the educator's sake, I'm trying to keep it so simple that a school in a small village in Honduras a teacher would get it and not be confused by some big words or some advanced technique in education. You know, you know, there's a lot of education speak. And I want to help them remember that they got this, they have the tools they need, but they're going to have to read out of their brain. So that's, I think that's my fear that I don't want to do that. Yeah. And, and I, I can easily slip into that. And that's the part that was getting boring, to be honest. That's when my proposal is like, this is kind of getting boring and like sort of soapboxy. I was yeah. like, okay, that's not what I want, but I'm feeling really passionate. And so I have to change that language so that the reader, this is not me complaining about education. This is inspiring young educators to think outside the box. Yeah. And and the reason I asked you that, because I have found that that's been a protection mechanism or a proving mechanism, probably actually more proving than protecting in my writing process where I'm like, must sound smart, this research study. And, you know, but like, and that's (laughs) where my, my eyes are glazing over, but, and like trying to prove that this is valid, that this, this is something that you should listen to, you know, this, proving energy um, mm. for me in, in noticing when I'm like research studies says, <laughs> like, right. and it's like, that's not even how I speak or how I activate my clients to do their work, to yeah. grow their teams, to build their businesses in a way where they still have space and time for their lives. So I love that you shared that it's like, right, stories and inspiration and like, how did I come up with it? And then here's how you can do it too. Like there is simplicity in that formula that you're saying versus kind of overstuffing and making it hard for people to, to digest. So I have to catch myself in that as well. And I think something else that I've learned in, you know, writing that another, you know, I guess I'm on my second draft and I'll be on third, fourth in in a couple of weeks. (laughs) (laughs) But I guess what I have learned is also sometimes we need to get all those parts of ourselves out and allow it to be seen, right? So that pedagogy version of yourself Mm -hmm. is like, hey, I know some things. Let me just, I just want to see if this might be helpful. Like, it's okay. Like to me, I'm no expert. I'm just an expert of my myself or learning (laughs) more and more every day, but that it's okay to like get all of it on the proving parts of me, the ego parts, the, the scared, the timid, like just let all those parts be seen when you're in draft mode, that's Elizabeth Gilbert talks about like the runway, right? Where Mm -hmm. you just kind of write all, all of the words or the, the shitty first draft and SFD from Anne Lamont. But I think I'm learning that about my own process is I actually have to 
to get it all out in all the different forms, whether it's, you know, research study this, but I know that can't stay there. And so giving ourselves permission that we will refine, we will polish later. The mantra that I have to tell myself, I'm not as cute as you with like having a (laughs) post-it, but I should have (laughs) one to remind myself is to really to like trust and write what I know and not from that like knowledge expertise type place, but from like, you already know this, like in this moment right now, the Jada right now, like just write, because what I'll try to do is look back at an old keynote or a this, or, you know, like the answers I've already said it somewhere, but like, how can I trust myself that I have the answers already right here? And I just have to put, you know, my fingers to the keys and write. So I battle with that a bit of trying to kind of gather my wisdom over the years. Like I've already done this work. It's already here. And then I get lost in what my friend Nikki Ellich Brown calls Google doc quicksand. I'm just like trying to like copy and paste and piecemeal different versions of myself over the years and, and thoughts. And I can see when I pull those in, how much I just start deleting right away of like, uh, there's a better way to say this today. And I understand what I mean more today than I did two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. I think, I think writers are either doing two things. They're either proving or they're hiding. They're just fluctuations and anywhere in between. And somewhere you have to find the balance of being vulnerable and showing up and also then telling why you're the unique messenger. Mm-hmm. I share your quote more than any other quote, even more than Maya Angelou's quote. What? <laughs> I do. And I, like, I talk to hundreds of would-be authors in a year and coach them. And I always tell them what you say, which is there's no unique messages, only unique messengers. And that I focus on that when I'm writing. So I don't forget, like, why are you telling, why are you the one? So why you, what's your perspective here? Why is this valuable? And I forget sometimes that I was a, a principal, to be honest, because that seems like a world ago. But I also forget that I was a principal and then I went back in the classroom, which to other principals seems like, oh, a demotion, you, you failed. Mm. I did it intentionally. And then I went back into the principalship, a better principal, because I was like, gosh, I can't believe I used to think that as a principal. And then I left the principalship again and went back in the classroom. And I've done that several times. And that gives me a unique perspective about all the things I thought were important. I wasn't listening to kids the whole time. I was doing those in and out. And that's what makes it valuable. Like those understandings, a simple, like, oh, I am the unique messenger here. It isn't because I'm smarter or more educated. I don't even have a degree in education, to be honest. So like, it's not because I'm smart in education. It's because I found that I wasn't doing the things that kids said. It was because I made a mistake. I misstepped for so long that, that, that I'm sharing my my faults and not my wisdom. And that's the difference, I think, for me. I have to remind mm. myself, I'm not. I could give a lecture on the state of education and the power of the shifts, but that's one boring and two, who cares? Someone else could do that without me, but someone can't do what I just talked about and done done it in this way. And no one's spent the last, you know, 25 years collecting 26,000 responses to the question. What nobody, you're great. Nobody. nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and if they even tried, they have a lot of years to catch up. So I, like, that's why I'm unique. So like, I have to remind myself, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's not what I know. It's this unique perspective that I bring to this conversation. Can you talk a little bit more about the faults and the wisdom? Like that was just like mm-hmm. a little spark for me that I was curious. I just wanted you to expand on. Yeah. So I realized in looking back, I wish I could realize it then. I wish I could say, I figured this out in year three and I was such a great teacher and I wasn't. I was a little afraid for a lot of years to be vulnerable with students and maybe even my staff as a principal, because I was being judged on what I thought a good teacher would be instead of listening to what a great teacher is. And a great teacher has never been defined by kids as someone who knows everything or is, is perfect or is better than somebody else. And so my faults that I realized were so valuable is there were times where I committed the biggest atrocity, which is assumed kids were wrong because they were young. And I, I wish I would have known that they're I always knew they were smarter than me because I'd watch them be smarter than me in front of me. Like, oh crap, they know more than me. What am I going to do? I should have leaned into that more. And instead I turned away and tried to protect myself by being more prepared and more organized. And so in my writing, I think revealing my faults to help encourage the others has been 
a little bit painful, to be honest, but also probably the most helpful and the most inspiring. And that I think it takes, it's taken me a lot of humility because I could write like I was trained an academic with a thesis statement and prove a point, but it wasn't ever very engaging or interesting or even that useful, to be honest. So I think it took a little humble pie to realize this whole conversation is about how I wasn't listening. And that's kind of humbling, Yeah. Um, but it's what's right. It's what's true. How do you unpack that for yourself on the page? So you would kind of catch yourself like, oh, I'm hiding. I'm not, I'm not sharing my faults. Like, is there mm-hmm. an example where you kind of caught yourself in the writing process and reshifted to like, let me be more vulnerable. Let me share my faults. Is there a specific? Yeah. So when you get these wonderful quotes from kids, it's easy to grab the, the ones that seem so true and put them on the, on the page and then just explain them. So I would explain what I thought the kids were saying in different quotes. <laughs> and I'll give an example of where to illustrate the point you're asking me. But that became like, again, me telling what I know, like, here's what kids say. And here's what I know about that. But when I started to lean into it, and this is where I discovered in the TED talk was when I shared about when I didn't do well. And it was a story about Yvette, who was this very stubborn, strong-willed Latina in my class when I worked in inner city LA. And she, she would just show up, you know, with her little jacket that all her other gang members wore. She'd just show up in the front row, no books, no, <laughs> no pencil, nothing. No nada. She just nada. showed up. She <laughs> sit with her groupies in the front. She showed up in the front row. You know, most kids are bad sitting in the back row. Not her. She's like, uh-uh, I'm sitting in the front. Just because she wasn't going to do anything doesn't mean she wasn't going to take a front seat. So that's kind of her persona. When she get up to leave the bathroom, the whole group of girls would walk out with her. They didn't ask permission. They whoop, there they went. I was like, who is this girl? And I realized she was incredibly brilliant. I think she was just bored out of her mind and also a leader. So I started to find my way with her. Well, as I started to push harder and the years went on, she was actually becoming one of the best students in the class. She was really articulate. She wrote really well. She started doing work, carrying books. Like, and so did those girls, they all started carrying books. It was pretty amazing. But what, what happened was one day she didn't turn in her homework. And instead of paying attention, I was disappointed. I said, where's your homework? And she's like, I really, I didn't, I couldn't do it. And I thought, I, this is not acceptable. You know, I want it in by tomorrow. And she came in, dropped in the next day, or like half done piece of work. And I said, you know what? You know, cause she had told me I'm trying and I, you know, I'm trying and like, I need to try harder. Well, she came back and turned it in. And I said, she said, I'm trying Mr. Toronto. I'm trying. And I said, and then I, I paused not because I was being intentional, but because I didn't know what to say to her. She goes, the electricity has been out in my house all week. And the only quiet place in my house normally is the bathroom. And there's no windows in there. And I was doing my homework all week with a candle that we had, but it burnt out and I just couldn't finish. And I'm trying. I remember thinking, oh my God, I wasn't listening when she said, I'm trying. She meant it, I'm trying, but not to the extent that I understood. I wasn't listening to her. I was trying to make her into something I was or that I wanted her to be. And so I really messed up. I, I dismissed it. And one of the quotes that inspired that remembrance was, a great teacher knows when you've fallen in a hole. And I, you know, that seems inconsequential. Like, mm-hmm. what does that really mean? But in that case, as I remembered that quote, I remembered the, the things that kids said, I was like, I missed it. I, I didn't notice she fell in a hole. I wasn't even looking. So I think that's where I'm choking up thinking about it. That's where I fell short. And it's humbling to think about, but it's also the most inspiring part. Cause like, if you listen, kids are telling you what they need. And they're trying really hard. If they say that, you got to trust them and then listen and do what they say, which is accept that I'm trying and move on and not try to put, I'm just trying to help you what the real world is going to do to you. Like that kind of crap is not real. That's that's an adult power struggle versus an understanding and empathetic listener. And so those moments is where the book started to come alive. I'm like, oh, here the book is. Here's, this is going to be a book about me having to be a little more vulnerable and not the teacher in the way and let the kids be the teacher here. And that, yeah. that's not easy. It's not easy for me because I'm used to being in charge of the teacher, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's, you know, a, a great way for us to, to lean in, in our own writing process and however we're, we're sharing, you know, in our businesses and a body of work and writing a book is to, to lean in there's a couple things that I heard, which was, you know, leaning into be more vulnerable about our own 
missteps or something that that we missed and how we can see where we gained the insight Mm -hmm. but also the like that quote of would you say catching in the hole can you say that i I, I believe the quote was a great teacher sees when a student falls in a hole yeah so i feel that you see this right when you're working with authors who Mm -hmm. lead (laughs) and (laughs) Like, do you feel like you, you know, when people (laughs) are in the hole? Yeah. I think I notice now because when they, if they didn't do their writing, whatever, I know it's never about, they're not able to, or they couldn't find their way. It's usually because there's an enormous fear or pressure that they're putting on themselves and that, but the conversation they want to have is not the conversation they need to have. And also it also needs to be me reminding myself of the incredible empathy to have for a writer it's the most terrifying thing I think I've ever done. Way more than speaking on a stage. Give me a stage any day. <laughs> Writing has been so much more vulnerable because it it's permanent. It feels permanent. And so I think what I've learned from kids and what and what the way I teach my programs is with what kids taught me on how to write. It's not the approach that most people think. And that comes from children. They're the ones that told me, I don't want to finish this this piece of writing. And I used to be a teacher that said, well, you started it, you can turn it in, it's going to be due. And now I'm saying, great, get rid of it. Just don't throw it away because maybe I'll teach you something later. Like I learned that from kids, like that gives them so much joy to know that they can start again and not be held to some, yeah. oh, this would be a good story. So I, I think that's the cues I take from, I try to see my authors the way I see students now is like, they're telling me what they need and want, but they just, they're not able to articulate it because they themselves aren't sure, but they'll give me the clues if I just listen and then. Sometimes it's encouragement, sometimes it's inspiration, or sometimes it's a challenge. But either, either way, I, if I'm listening, I'll, I'll understand more deeply. Yeah. I, I talked about this in a podcast conversation with Michelle, this book that I'm reading, How to Help Your Anxious Teen. And it talks about mm. to connect before you correct. And also like, we don't even need to correct, you know, but it's just kind <laughs> of a, a catchy thing of like basically leaning into empathy first before mm. trying to teach or coach or guide or inform, you know, all of those, those things that we can get into as parents, but just being able to, to listen, which is what your book is talking about, right. Being able to listen. And I think when you mentioned the fear part and so something unique, I'm going to have a conversation with my life coach, Rebecca McLaughlin. I've been working with her for over six years now since, you know, when I was still in the buyout process of simple green smoothies and really just learning how to have awareness of emotions. I was very, I have, you know, a lot of childhood trauma, disassociation, like using my intellect to kind of power through and that resiliency. And so I did a solo writing retreat. I've done three so far where I go and stay in a hotel for a couple of nights. And this was in my prescription from Rebecca, but I would have calls with her almost every day of my solo writing retreat in the hotel. So I wasn't working with an editor. I wasn't working with a book coach. I was working with my life coach on the mm. emotional resistance, the blocks, the stuck, the stickiness of writing And I just never thought of like, I lean on her for a lot of things because it's like, she hasn't written a book before, like, you know, but it was one of the most helpful things. It was also very helpful because she's my resident life coach for my clients and my group programs. And she's the one that comes to retreats to hold emotional space because I'm like, I got to focus on the vision and the strategy. And if people fall apart, I need you to be here to catch them because our emotional needs need to be tended to. And like you said, writing a book is, is challenging. It's hard work. Like we've been putting years in (laughs) just like years of thinking, of collecting notes, of talking about it, of hiring people to support us, of co-writing with people, reading books, watching videos, writing, not writing, resisting writing, you know, all of the things like it's such a long-term relationship. We were just talking before we started recording, right? Like, you better like your book. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> you're going to be with it for a long, long, long time. And if you don't like it, you better learn to like it and choose right. to love it. You know, I have a tattoo on my arm that my husband and I got on our like 10-year 
we were already married, but it was our, we have a kissing anniversary basically of when we <laughs> like our first kiss and it was like our 10 year first kiss anniversary. So I have a tattoo that says choose love. Mm. And I think a big part for my husband and I, we've been married for 16 years. And when we first started dating, he, you know, he's like, I choose to love you. Like, I don't have to love you. I'm not in love with you. And I was like, that's not sexy. That's not romantic. <laughs> like, ew, you're not in love with me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, love is a choice. We can, we can choose into that. We can choose to, to lead with love. We can choose to be in love with the process, with our books. Like we, we have to build that type of relationship and trust with ourselves and with our books. I don't know. What are yeah. your thoughts on that? Yeah, I love, well, I love that, what you shared about your husband saying he's choosing to be alone with you. It's such a good analogy with the work of a book because it is a labor of love. And like I said, I quote you more than my Angelou. So the other quote I use is from my Angelou, which is, there's no greater agony than an untold story inside of you. But I would add to that, and there's no greater agony than a, a story you've been holding on to that you tell and give to the world. Because now you're like, oh my gosh, it's out now. What do I do? How do I love this when I change? Because this is the thing. Mm. You're writing it in a container and it is a snapshot of who you are, what you believe. That's why writing about more of who you are as a human is more important than what you think. Because you might change what you think. As a human, you might grow and evolve, but hopefully your essence is, is similar. And so you can be proud of the person you are in that book. And that's something you want to celebrate, but you also have to be prepared. If you don't tell your truth, then you look back and be like, Oh, I don't believe that more. I don't think that way, but this is still who I am. And let me give you an example of what that looks like when you don't, I always say there's two types of books. There's a transactional book, which are really helpful. The 101 Instagram secrets to make you famous would be an exciting, that's, that's a made up book, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to write it. I'm going to write it. As well. <laughs> you might be the only person I know that could write it. Um, no, I won't. But. <laughs> but, right. but you get the sense like, Oh, yes. that would be great. I want it. I want that. It's useful. But the books that I tend to, to, to be inspired by and the ones I help clients with is transformational books, which is where you're shifting inside as the author and you're growing to a new space that you're not, you've never been before. And that's uncomfortable, but those are the books that lead forward. I have an author who wrote a book and became known for like the Kickstarter queen, could help you launch your kids. Well, that book is wonderful, but she has to like turn off that email because she can't stop being that person because that's the persona she was being, you know, it's, it was informational and transactional. But if you write a book that's from who you are, even if you shift in what your focus is business wise or what you're doing hourly shifts, a book about something more deeply aligned with who you are probably won't be misaligned in the next iteration of self. It should just be here with you now. And I think that's what I think of my simple little book that started this whole journey for me, which is The Art of Apprenticeship, was a simple book for me about how to how to find a mentor through service. How do you serve a master in the old days, which is go be the blacksmith's you know, apprentice and you sweep up the shavings, you do deliveries. You don't sit there and they teach you all day. That's not how you acquire your knowledge. You have to be willing to serve. And that book was really what I needed to grow and build my relationship with Pat Flynn, which is I want to serve this man because I want him to be my mentor, but I'm not going to say, will you be my mentor? I'm going to do it. What I said in these principles of the book, that book still holds true for me, even though I don't want to be a teacher of that principle, like go around and lecture about it or do workshops or courses. But the, the essence of that is who I am. Mm. And I, that's what I mean. Like that's the part of it that you have to be willing to, to see yourself on the page or you'll, you'll look at it and go, Oh, I can't believe that's what I wrote. Yeah. I love that distinction. And I know we've talked about transactional versus transformational books in the past, but even that's like meta of showing how we can deepen our understanding and illustrations of what we mean by a certain thing. Cause it, the essence part just, it really resonated with me in this moment of like, ah, like I know it's like, even though I'm no longer in simple green smoothies anymore, right? Like, mm -hmm. but I don't lose the essence of who Jada was in that company and who I am in, in the company that I run today, right? So it's like right. really understanding your your essence and the energy and that it's like <laughs> your evergreen mm -hmm. self, right. like bring your evergreen self into each of these it. books. <laughs> right. You don't want it to get stale or not be true. Right. Right. That book I still read and I laugh because like it wasn't what I knew, but it's what I believed because I hadn't 
put it into practice, like in real time. Are you talking about the apprentice book? Yeah. Okay, because I hadn't really done it and said, okay, here's how I, here's how I did it. I probably should update that book and say, well, here's what happened as a result of what I wrote, which is kind of ironic that yeah. I didn't have it, but the, the principles were true to me and they still are. And that's why I'm saying that so many of us try to pull ourselves away from the book out of fear that we'll be judged. But if you don't, then you'll never really have a book that shows who you are. Yeah. Can people get access to that first round book? Um, yeah, it's still out there. I, it's got a, a hideous cover. It is, it's it's well edited, but it's out there in the world. And I just don't talk about it, but, but it's still there. If you want. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I only ask because I feel like you and I have very similar relationship building skill sets that mm. are very just true to who we are and, and how we show up and serve. Like that was my internship into like the online business world and getting paid as a virtual assistant. But I was like, I'll work for free. You know, like yeah. those, just how we kind of build those relationships in a way that feels really authentic and generous without needing anything in return. But there's an intent. Yeah, There's a soft intention of like, it would be nice if like something yeah. like this unfolded. Yeah. It's an admiration really. I like, I admire what you're doing and I wish someday I could maybe do that, but I know that I don't know anything and I'm here to serve. And maybe every once in a while, you'll give me a scrap to try to practice on and work on a horseshoe, even if it doesn't go anywhere, but know that I'm here in that capacity changes your relationship to that person. And doesn't like, Hey, can I pick your brain for a minute? Can I get coffee with you? That seems very like, give me, give me, give me. Yeah. And that's what I didn't want to ever be, but I didn't know what to do. Cause I couldn't do it through online courses. Like the, I just got lost in information. I needed mentorship, but I didn't know how to do that outside of education. You know, I, I had a, a, a different persona there in, in the world of entrepreneurship. All the young kids were the ones doing it. And I was this old dude. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So I, I think that that essence is still how I want to live my life. And kind of grow and that won't change. It really won't. And that's what I really want this book, current book to be like, I may never be in the classroom, but if I did, these principles would still be the ones I would take in the classroom. And yeah. some people told me in front of the talk, I use this with my family. I, I didn't realize I could ask my kids, tell me what would make me a great dad and then mm -hmm. listen what they say and then do it. That's helpful because now they're applying it outside of the place where I intended it, but that's exciting too. Yeah. And I also want to name this other piece of like this, I've been saying like books are a capsule of mm -hmm. time. Like it's like a time stamp in your journey. And because there's, so with Simple Green Smoothies, you know, that book came out in 2015, but my heart was already out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was already ready for the next chapter of, of my life and, and career but I needed that, not that I needed that book, but that book allowed me to encapsulate that time in my life mm -hmm. and that journey. And like it, you know, me, when I look at the book and there's photos of George and Zoe and my business partner, Jen and her family. And like, just that there's like, it's just like a remembrance of that time. And even as I'm working on, you know, the book for women entrepreneurs right now that I'm working on with Harper Business, it feels like another capsule. Like it's like closing a loop, closing a chapter, a season of experience and wisdom and thoughts and beliefs and perspectives. And I can feel my soul like is like, and I want to write this book over here, like a memoir, creativity, art. Like there's this, like there's this, this pool, but it's a not yet. It's like, let's complete mm -hmm. this this right here. Let's like yeah. bottle this up and encapsulate this wisdom because you are going to move and shift from this space at some point. We don't know when, but this is an affordable, accessible tool that people can get access to, even if you are no longer the spokesperson for that body of work. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it makes total sense. I actually learned from Gay Hendricks, who's the author of The Big Leap, who's been on my show a couple of times, that it's okay to have material and books overlap. Like, don't think that you never, oh, I won't be able to ever speak about this again. No, they, they're supposed to be. Their messages can be reiterated in different places, different ways. And that just amplifies its power. It doesn't diminish it. Like, you don't have to create all original content for anything new you create. Your story still goes there. Your principles can still go there, even though the focus of that book is different. And that... As you do that, as you create 
these capsules as you call them to know that you know you're putting the best you have for now and you're going to have more to put in there and more lessons to learn and whatever else comes because if you rewrote the book you write now in 10 years from now it would be a different book no matter what and that'd be okay the biggest mistake i see authors make is thinking that they have to be perfect or their message has to be so clear because they're changing in the middle of the writing and they notice something they wrote four months ago. Like, mm, I really don't think that anymore. I'm going to change. I'm like, be careful because when you're done with that, something else will look like that to you and you have to be cautious. And that's why you have to be present on the page and not so much. Here's what I think, or here's what I know. And I think a lot of people get stuck in perfectionism. I think they're just procrastinating, putting something out there because they don't feel like it's going to represent them later. Yeah. An editor that I worked with, I had like a couple of calls with Emily Gendel Sparger, I think is how you say her last name. But she said like not to hoard <laughs> stories. So, you know, I, like I have this dream that I'll, I'll write a memoir one day and I have and a fiction book and all kinds of things. Like I have just these images and ideas of, of just having this life long love affair with, you know, learning the craft of writing. And I, I feel like I'm just at the beginning, but I notice myself holding some stories back of like, oh, maybe that goes in the memoir or maybe, you know, like what goes here and what goes there. And it's like, you can share that story later too. So don't like hoard it and like, oh, this is for another book. So I love that you share that from Gay because I I love that book, The Big Leap and love that wisdom of that we can share stories more than once. And and as we share them, our embodiment and understanding of the story and the meaning that we attach to it, it just deepens. And we also get more clues and visual memories and sensory details that maybe we couldn't think of in that first book, or I don't know. I just, I, yeah, I just love the idea of that things can be repeated and need to, we need to hear things over and over again. Yeah. If I would have told the story about a vet when it happened, I probably would have missed the point, to be honest. Mm -hmm. In fact, that was an unknown story until someone else, another student wrote a quote that struck me. So it wasn't even what she said that struck me. It was what another student said that I was like, oh my God, I I miss that. Like, I miss that. How can I have missed that? So yeah, I think there's going to be times you're going to tell it differently. And in a memoir completely, because a memoir is telling something as you see it now, even though it occurred in the past. Yeah. So you're retelling a truth may not be the accuracy, but it is what you see. And I help you, as you know, I've helped lots of people with memoirs and lately I've been helping a lot of YouTubers, which is interesting because they, they have a public life. So to get with Mm. them personal and tell personal stories is a little scary because they're used to sharing really cool things. And then to share these vulnerable things is, could be scary. But what I, what I tell them, I know you've told the story before on your YouTube channel in this way, but you, your intention was to get views. Mm. Your intention here is to tell what we didn't see. They're like, oh, and I said, don't filter. Don't try to tell me what you think I want to hear. Tell me what you think. So that's a, it's a little bit of allowing yourself the freedom to realize you could tell the same story 20 times and all of them can be different. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not cheapening it or changing it or embellishing it. It's the truth because the truth is what you say it is. So you're helping people understand that. And that's how things iterate and grow and become more meaningful. Yeah. Oh, so wonderful. I love that we're on this, this parallel <laughs> book path together and to be able to do another behind the scenes. Yeah. My next book, part three. <laughs> and hopefully maybe the next time we talk, like manuscripts will have been submitted will be in promotion mode or something. There, yes, there's just be so fun. many, like I'm like parking promotion, not yet. Right now yeah. it's just about generating, writing, then I'll move into the editing, tightening, polishing, crafting phase. And and then I will give myself permission to to dive into the fun part of like getting people on board to to help share and bring this message to more people. So yeah, no, I think that's great. Uh, it's such an honor as always to talk to you and to be inspired by you. I definitely feel very honored to have been a small part of that, the book writing journey. It's definitely not small. Obviously, we have several conversations talking about <laughs> okay, this. That's okay, fair. Also, it's not small. And it's also like the seeds, right? The germinating seeds, the mini seeds of some of those were stories and things that were unpacked are for that memoir, for something else that mm-hmm. won't make it in these 
these pages. So people just keep following the journey and me just staying in my essence and each part of the process. That's right. Exactly. Awesome. Asul, how do people find out more about you, especially when this book gets completed? And I know there'll be many more in addition to that. Well, you can always go to listen to my podcast called Authors Who Lead because I interview amazing authors like yourself. But also that's probably where I'll share how the book process is going for me. I'm a little scared to actually unpack my process in public. Steve's going to be interviewing my husband about that. So I can't actually hide through knowing how it goes. Because he knows. He sees you. He (laughs) knows. But also you can find me on all social media at Azul Taronis. Yes. And for me, jadaselner.com and the Lead with Love podcast. And I'll be unpacking my writing process with my book coach, Rebecca. Yeah, soon. And and an episode coming up soon because that I think it's important for us to hear that behind the scenes of how we actually show up and do our work. And I'm so like, I'll save it for that episode because I'm like, what's Azul doing? I want to know because I am so fascinated by how do we get, you know, ourselves to the page and, and maintain the stamina to get it to the finish line too, which is no easy feat. I agree. I love you, Azul. I love you, my friend. All right. Thank you so much for your heart and attention and listening to Lead with Love. You can always get the links and resources mentioned in each episode over at leadwithlovepodcast.com so that you can build a sustainable business and live a creative life on your terms. If this message, Leading with Love, resonates with you and you want to take a stand for remembering that there are humans with beating hearts behind the numbers, I would love for you to subscribe so you never miss an episode and leave an honest review. It would mean the world to me and it also helps more people spread more love in the world, which we really, really need. I also love hearing from you. So as you're listening, take a screenshot, share your favorite takeaway and tag me on Instagram and Facebook at Jada Selner. I really appreciate you and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.